Thank you, Pastor Isaac. Thank you for that warm uh, and generous introduction. And thank you, everyone, for the privilege of being here together with all of you uh, on this wonderful weekend. Thank you for your kind invitation, Pastor Lindsay and your team, uh, to have me as your conference speaker for the, for the Leaders' Conference. Uh, some of you I know, some of you, uh, because you've been at a Leaders' Conference, some of you, uh, I may be new. Uh, yes, it is true what Pastor Isaiah said. You know, I am a, a bivocational pastor. And all and the church that I pastor, all the pastors there, all ten pastors are all bivocational pastors. So, uh, in essence, we we are in the workplace uh, in the nine to five window on the weekdays. So for me, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a medical specialist. So you know, on the weekdays, as Pastor Isaiah said, I am a doctor, pastor. Okay. On the weekends, I am a pastor, doctor. Okay. People say, what's the difference? Well, I tell them, weekdays you see me. You pay. Weekend, it's free. Okay? So, this is a weekend. It's free. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's free this weekend. Okay? Praise God. Um, I'd like to just share with you something that's very close to my heart that I believe is part and parcel of what God wants to do in this church. And as we have a, a, the, the, the follow-through from the, the Leaders' Conference, we have had breakthrough, many things. Breakthrough power, breakthrough vision, breakthrough encounters. And now this morning, I want to just follow that lead uh, from the Breakthrough Conference weekend and talk about new ways in our thinking, breakthrough thinking, in the ways that God wants us to see uh, who we are and what we are called to do as a church. So I want to talk today about the workplace. And I want to entitle this, God Loves Your Workplace, Spirituality and Success in the Workplace. Uh, and I, as, as I address this, I'm also addressing those of you who are online, you know, hi to you and uh, welcome to this wonderful service this morning. You're part and parcel of the great family of God, whether you're on site and online, you're highly favoured, greatly blessed and deeply loved. This morning, I want to speak about this, the workplace and, and let me take you through this journey because I feel that this is what God is saying to the church of the 21st century uh, and particularly to Faith AG Church. God wants you to begin to break the walls of this church down into your community, into the workplace, into the people that are outside the church because we have been defining the church too long in terms of four walls in which worship of God must take place. Uh, that, that's, and, and without these four walls, you know, God cannot function. That's Old Testament thinking. And I will show you that as we come into a fresh way of thinking in our breakthrough conference together. Many years ago, uh, Nancy and I, we bumped into this man called Alan Robey. He's the original Spider-Man. Have you heard of him before? Anyone have you heard of this man? Wave your hands in the air. He's the original Spider-Man. He's a Frenchman who is able to climb vertical tall structures all over the world. And he slipped quietly into KL to climb the Petronas Twin Tower, then the highest uh, building in the world. And we bumped into him in a hotel lobby. And he was not very famous then, but I immediately recognized him. I said, you're Alan Robey. He was quite chuffed that we recognized him. And uh, we got talking, and uh, he took a couple of pictures with us, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and I said, you, you, don't, you don't mind, I'm a medical doctor. Can I kind of feel your body? You know, I just want to feel you, what, what it's like. He says, go ahead, you know. And he was quite short, uh, but every bit of his body is lean and mean. That's not a millimeter of fat on him. Everything is sinew and tendon and muscles. He was built for the climb. Then I said something to him. I said, can I have a look at your hands? I, I, I'm so fascinated. I'm a doctor. I want to look at your hands. So I look at Alan Robey's hands. And, you know, his hands are quite different from ours. Whereas most of our hands, firstly, his fingers are very broad and big disproportionately big. And if you look at his thumb and his fingers, most of our thumbs, and uh, uh, our fingers especially, all taper off at the end, not any base. They are flattened out and broadened at the end. And that is very simply to give him maximum surface area for traction. Because sometimes when he climbs these vertical tall structures free solo, he has to pull himself up just by a pincer grip, the whole body, before he gets the next pincer grip. That's how he climbs his tall structures. And just that pincer grip alone, I will tell you this, and it gripped me. It's actually, I think, enough to throttle the life out of a full-grown man, just that. It is so powerful and strong. 
Now, I don't know what your hands look like this morning, whether you're at home watching this or whether you're on site. I want you to look at your hands right now. Just look at your hands. Lift up your hands and look at it. Come on, be proud of your hands. Look at it. You know, uh, do they look nice? Well, that's not a conviction. I don't hear conviction. Do they look nice? Are you sure? Okay, now look at your neighbor's hands. Look across at your neighbor's hands. And tell your neighbor, nice hands. And then tell your neighbor one more time, but my hands look nicer. Just tell them that, okay? Now I want to tell you this. God has given us the hands to establish our workplace. Psalm 90 verses 12 and 16 to 17, which is the Psalm of Moses. Moses probably wrote the Psalm towards the end of his life. If you read the context, it's very likely about the, it's towards the end of his life. And he has seen the hand of God using his hands to incredible miracles. As you know, he lifted up his hands, Red Sea parted. He lifted up his hands, the plagues came. There was something that God used ordinary hands to do. And Moses wrote these words. He said, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Everybody, look at your hands one more time. One more time, okay? Everybody say, these are ordinary hands. Say it loud. Say, these are ordinary hands. But in God's hands... They become extraordinary. Can somebody say amen to that? Now I want you to say it loud. With these hands. Say it loud. With these hands. I will heal the sick. I will bless the poor. I will cast out demons. I will bring anointing on lives. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? God wants to establish the work of your hands. And that's what you do when you go out into the workplace. I want to tell you this, the power of your hands symbolically represents something that's incredible. We rule the world as a species, not just because of our intellect. People think it's just our intellect. That's why, our intelligence as a species, that's why we rule the world. That's why we, we have command over all the, all the animals and all nature and everything else. It's just not that. It's our intellect plus our hands. Just think, if you're intelligent but you have no arms or legs, the chimpanzees will finish it all, us off. The other wild animals will finish us off. We wouldn't have survived as a species. We would have become extinct. So actually to dominate the world, we need intellect and we need hands. That's the third thing we need also. We need cooperation, okay, in terms of information. And we dominate the world. We dominate the world. We need intellect and we need hands. Because some species of animals, like the, like the porpoises and the, the dolphins, they're very smart, but they don't dominate the world. Why? No hands. With these hands alone, you can create machinery that is so exquisitely fine, like an electron microscope, like the Large Hadron Collider, that can detect and that can measure and that can study subatomic particles. With these hands alone, it's so fine you can do a micro dissection of a neurovascular surgeon. With these hands, we can create huge, huge tall buildings, huge machinery, huge rockets that can propel people to moon and to Mars. Hands. Establish the work out of the hands. And where do you find that the hands need to really work? In the workplace. The workplace. What is the workplace? The workplace is, for all intents and purposes, I call it the marketplace. It is a space, actual, virtual, or metaphorical, in which trade and services are performed. Because of this definition, any and everything that happens outside the church on a Sunday on the religious service, anything that happens outside your house on a connect group or cell group, you know, religious activity, it's the workplace. It is the workplace. Some people say, Pastor, I'm not at work anymore. I'm retired. You're in the workplace. Because when other people go to work, you can go to your kopitiam and you can reach people other people cannot reach. You can walk around your HDB flats or your condominium or around where your house is and you can touch people and reach people that I cannot reach because I'm going to work. That's your workplace because it's outside the church. It's outside, it's outside the walls of the church. That's your workplace. Oh, I'm just a homemaker. Oh, you can reach the workplace. When you actually say, see your kids off at school, to school and they're on a bus or you can pick your kids up from school or pick your kids up from a tuition centre, you are meeting other parents and other, other homemakers. You're in a workplace. You can reach them. I can't reach them. You can. Oh, I'm a student. You're in a workplace. You can reach other students I can't reach. 
Yeah, I'm teaching in a, in a school. I'm teaching in a university. You're in a workplace. Every one of us, so long as you're outside the walls of the church and you're touching the community, whether it's the poor or whether it's in the workplace, you are in the workplace. Can somebody say amen? Now you understand what the workplace is. Let me then take you. That means every one of us has a part to play in the workplace. All the retired people, the students, the people who are at work, the young parents, the homemakers, every one of us. The moment we step outside the church building on a Sunday, on a Monday to Friday, we're in a workplace. Okay? So let me just tell you what the workplace is. Uh, uh, you know, to, to, to actually touch the workplace, we need a mindset change. To influence the marketplace, we must have a vision to change our mindset. It's new thinking. If we don't change our mindsets, you know, we will never break outside the walls of a church. We will never break outside the walls of a church. And that will be a tragedy. Because I want to take you to the New Testament and show you that the original theology and biblical understanding is that the church must reach the world and not wait for the world to come into the church. You see, there are three, four things we must break. The first is a sacred secular divide mindset. The sacred secular divide mindset says this, uh, you know, the church is holy and outside Monday to Friday is secular. It's unholy. It's dirty ground. No, read the New Testament. It will tell you all work is holy. There's no sacred secular divide in our calling. The Lord said to us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever work you do, do it as unto the Lord, not unto human masters. So when you go to work, you're not serving. Of course, you have to serve you know, the, the company. You're under the supervision of your supervisor, your manager, or your boss, or your CEO. But ultimately, you're not serving them. The Bible tells us that. You are serving the Lord. Somebody say, Amen. amen. And just in case you think work is just a secular invention, Work was God's idea before the fall. So tomorrow morning, some of you wake up in the morning and you've got to go to work on a Monday morning. We suffer from Monday morning blues. And we think, wow, work is a curse because I've got to go to work. No, work was God's big idea from the word go in His perfect creation. It was God's big idea. And you know, you, you read Genesis 1 verses 28. It says, subdue the earth. Have dominion over the fish of the sea. Subdue the earth means work. God put man in the Garden of Eden to tend it. That's work. To tend it, you have to work. See, this was all before the fall. The reason why Monday morning is so hard and the week is so hard is because of sin. When sin entered the world, the workplace became hard. In some parts, it became toxic. And that's the reason why. But, you know, I, I want you to understand that when you wake up on a Monday morning, you're going to God's big idea. It may be tainted by sin and difficulty, but work is God's big idea. Why? Because in the Bible, work is worship to God. Don't think that just because we're here on a Sunday, we're raising our hands, getting goosebumps, and wow, God's holy presence. That's, that's worship. No. You go into the Bible, you'll find that when you go to the 9 to 5 window, the workplace window, and you are working, work is worship. Because the Hebrew word for worship is the word evodah. Evodah actually is the same word that's used for work and the same word that's used for worship. When the Lord said to the people of Israel in Exodus 20 verse 9, six days shall you labor, six days shall you work, six days shall you evodah. When Moses stood before Pharaoh, and say, thus says the Lord Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness, so that they may evodah me in the wilderness. Work is worship. Worship is work. Now, the moment I say this and you understand this, you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, I thought my work has no meaning. I thought my work, there's no purpose in my work. It's just to earn money to, you know, to feed my family or to have a HDB flat or condominium or whatever and, and, and you know, to, to travel. No, you suddenly realize, there's purpose in work. See, when we don't have a purpose in work and we divide a sacred secular, or Sunday is sacred, this is what is important to God. Work is secular. God is not interested in it. It's just a, it's just a curse of modern life. It's just a necessity. I just need to earn the money to you know, give to the church and I need to earn the money just to feed my family. The moment you dichotomize your life like that, think about it. That means it's not, it's not important to God. There's no purpose there in God. It's not part of your worship to God. You wasted one third of your you're waking all your, your life. Because every day, you go to work, eight hours. 
One third of our lives just get frittered away for the next 20, 30, 40 years. What a waste. So we must understand that there's no sacred secular divide. There is no such thing as some work that is more, that it is more holy unto God. There's no such thing. You know, in the church, the church thinking is this. Pastors, missionaries, church workers, these are the ones who are really spiritual. You know, and there's a hierarchy. And if you are in the caring profession like nurses and doctors, wow, these are also very caring, very spiritual. You think about me, I'm a pastor and a doctor. You know, I should be walking on air. Do you know what I mean? That's false. That's false. And we think, you know, in the hierarchy of the spirituality of work, God, no, other works must be quite low down. Because, you know, when you get to bankers, and, and the teaching profession is not bad. But when you get to bankers and business people, that's quite low down. And in Malaysia, when you get to lawyers and politicians and used car dealers, you know, it's really right at the very, very bottom. Do you know what I mean? So, so these are, who said so? There can be honest, deep politicians. Somebody say amen. There can be honest car dealers. Come and say amen. There can be good and fair and honest lawyers. Somebody say amen. Every bit of your work, provided it's not illegal, not illicit, not unethical, not immoral, all work is worship unto God. Somebody say a loud amen with me. I've shown you from the scriptures. This is what, this is God's idea. So when we understand this, in terms of calling, we are all priests. That means, you know, you all understand that you are all priests to the all believers. Can somebody say amen? Are, you, we, are, we, are we priests to the all believers? Because the Bible tells us that, right? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We are all priests. Now, everybody read this verse. Read it really loud, okay? So that it's conviction. So that everybody out on the street can hear that something exciting happening in this church. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, really loud, including those of you at home, go. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the ex excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So, it's a royal priesthood. But many of us think we are, we are, we are all priests. We all think. But we are all priests only on a Sunday. I've shown you that work is holy unto God. That means when you walk into your church, when you walk into your office on a Monday, the priest, your royal priesthood, the priest is there. You're there. You're part and parcel of God's minister. You are God's minister. You are God's priest. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a priest. Do that right now. Turn to your neighbor one more time and say, you don't look like one, but you are a priest. So actually, you know, you, you know, when you live in a secular society, when you live in a kind of fast-moving society at Singapore, you know, the whole secular world will say, you know, when Friday comes, thank God it's Friday, right? TGIF, right? The cry of every Christian believer and every Christian who is a workplace minister is when you wake up tomorrow on a Monday morning, it's thank God it's a Monday. Everybody say, thank God it's Monday. I make sure you believe that when you say that tomorrow morning, okay? Thank God it's Monday. Here's the second thing, second mindset change. Okay, second mindset is that the 9 to 5 window, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. window. Okay, that's in the West. But in Singapore, it's probably the 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. window. I don't know. The, the 9 to 5 window or the workplace window is the largest mission field in the world today. It's not the 1040 window. It's not the restricted nations window. It is the 9 to 5 window. Here's the point. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to missions in Cambodia or Vietnam, or Tibet, or whatever. I'm not saying that. We should go, because God is, is the God of the nations. But here's the point. If we should go, but here's the point. The moment you walk out of your, of your front door, or your HTV flat, or condominium, or whatever, the moment you walk out, you are entering the largest mission field in the world tomorrow. You are. And uh, we, when we understand that, we realize, wow, I must have a purpose. I must have a purpose. Uh, I don't know what's happened. Uh, the slides are gone. Okay. Can I have the next slide? Guys, okay. Let's move on. Move on. Okay, so the line to, 9 to 5 window is the largest mission field in the world today. I will tell you this. The way the world is going is that it's growing increasingly urbanized. That's increased. Singapore is 100% urbanized. 
Okay, Malaysia is about by in ten years time, in eight years time, Malaysia will be eighty five percent urbanized. Here's the point: if you don't have a mission and you don't have a vision for the community outside the church, in fifty years time, the church will become obsolete. See, we have been brought up in church in thinking that we must wait for the world to come into the church. Only in the church can the Holy Spirit move. Only in the church can people get saved. But, you know, that's not true. Because if you're going to wait for the church, people to get saved coming into church, the world will just explode in its population and the church will be left behind. The years time, the church will become irrelevant. Because the urbanization that's happening in the world today has never happened at this kind of level, at this rate throughout human history. So if the church does not have a vision, it will become obsolete. You look at the, the cities in the world, the largest cities in the world. 2014, eight out of the 10 largest cities in the world are in Asia. 2030, nine out of the largest cities in the world will be in Asia. Can you imagine what 2050 will be like? This is it. If the church does not have a vision for the city and the community outside, the poor outside, right through, we will become obsolete and irrelevant. Um, I can't move this on, so I'm not sure whether uh, something... Oh, okay, guys. Okay, so let me just tell you about Jesus' public ministry. Sorry about that, there's a couple of hitches. I, I just tell me about Jesus' public ministry, okay? When you go to the New Testament, you will find that 92% of Jesus' ministry is not in church. It's outside the synagogue, it's outside the temple. That's his public ministry. That's where he went. He was always relevant to the people. 86% of Jesus' parables, you can read it, yeah, are all about examples from the marketplace, from the workplace. He didn't tell many parables of people in a religious setting. And the New Testament apostles followed this. So that 97% of all the miracles in the Acts of the Apostles were all in the marketplace, all in the workplace. Here's the point. But the church is inverted in its thinking. We expect God to move during a Holy Spirit weekend. Where? In church. We expect people to be saved on a Sunday or other conferences. Oh no, evangelistic rally. Where? In church. Or in a church hall, in a religious meeting. Here's the point. Go back to the New Testament. Majority of miracles. Casting out demons. People falling under the power of the Spirit. Healings, breakthroughs, conversions all took place in the marketplace. So this is a new way of thinking. Not new way. This is going back to the old scripture way of thinking. The reason why we don't think like that is because we've we have inherited institutionalized medieval pietistic thinking from European church history where they locked up the nuns and the monks in one place and these are the holy people. All other people outside secular. And then we have a clergy-laity divide. And when we, that happens, eventually, oh, only the clergy, only the full-time workers, only the pastors, they are the holy people. They are the ones who really are serving God. The rest of us, we just work out there, you know what, it's a secular world, we just do our best, and all the church is interested is our tithes. We couldn't be more wrong. Go back to the New Testament. That's not true. What the number of people who are saved, the majority of people who are saved, you look at the New Testament, they were outside in the marketplace. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, where they were saved? On a fishing boat. That's their marketplace, that's their workplace. Simon the sorcerer was saved on the street of Samaria. Cornelius was saved, not in a church or a synagogue, but in his home. That's a marketplace. The lame man was saved, where? In the marketplace. Where was his workplace? Outside the beautiful gate, that was his workplace. Okay? Zacchaeus was saved, where? On the streets of Jericho. Where did he tax the people? on the streets of Jericho, or on the shops of Jericho. Lydia was saved outside Philippi by the river, not in the church. Dionysius was saved. He's a professor in, in, in Athens. He was saved in the university. Okay. What, Matthew was saved where? In the tax collector's office. How many of you like people from the Inland Revenue? Can I see your hands? Okay. You better love them because one of our Gospels is written by somebody from the Inland Revenue. Matthew. He got saved in the tax office. If people from the Inland Revenue can be saved, oh, I tell you, Jesus can save anybody, man. Okay, so, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch was saved. Where was he saved? In his motorcade. As he was going back from Jerusalem, back to Ethiopia, passing through Gaza, with his entourage. And Philip got up and saved. 
and he saved him. You know, Sergius Paulus was saved. Where? He was a proconsul of Cyprus. He was saved in a civil service buildings. Civil servants can be saved in a civil service workplace. The Philippian jailer was saved. Where? In prison. Prison ministry started in Acts chapter 16. Okay? Uh, Jairus' family was saved at home. You know, Publius was saved, you know, in, in, out in the workplace and on the island of Malta. You see all these guys, significant guys again, significant or insignificant, whatever. They were saved in the workplace. So the second thing that you must understand, the largest mission field in the world is the workplace. And the workplace is what happens, all the activity that happens outside the church walls on a Sunday. That's the workplace. Okay? Here's the thing, the third thing we must do. We must hear cry, God's cry for the, for the workplace. Jesus only wept on two occasions. The Bible only told us, or at least it recorded only two occasions, Jesus wept. Okay, Jesus probably has wept other occasions, probably. But the Bible records for us only two occasions. And the Holy Spirit never misses. When He records His two occasions, there must be a reason why. Jesus wept only on two occasions. Number one, for Lazarus, a friend, John 11. And then secondly, for a workplace, city, Jerusalem, the city, Luke 19. There's only two times Jesus wept. What's the common thread running through these two occasions where Jesus wept? Where the tears, you know, of the divine were shed. Firstly, both were dearly loved. Jesus loved Lazarus. Lazarus was a dear friend. Jerusalem was dearly loved. It's the city of God. God has a special heart for Jerusalem right through the pages of the Old Testament into the New. Both were dearly loved. Secondly, both were waiting for Him. Lazarus was waiting and Jesus didn't appear and He was dead four days before Jesus appeared. Both were waiting for Him. Jerusalem had always been waiting for the Messiah to visit. Both were waiting for Him. And here's the third point. Both were dead until he came. Lazarus was dead until Jesus came. Jerusalem and the workplace out there is dead until you bring Jesus in. And you can bring Jesus in because you are a priest. They will never come to church. You can invite them for evangelistic meeting. Maybe 0.1% may come in. The majority won't come to church. Who's going to be gospel to them? You may not look like one, but you are a minister. And the workplace where you have is your worship to God. The only difference is that they don't know you are a priest and you don't take an offering. But you are a priest in the workplace. The workplace is meaningless on its own. You don't bring God into your workplace, you will secularize your workplace. You wasted one third of your life because you're just earning to feed the family, earning to get some money for your HDB flat or to go on, on to travel. That, that's all you're doing. You're wasting your life. There's no purpose other than just earn money and just to bring the tithe to the church. No, this is meant to be a worship place. This is meant to be a place where you touch the, the, the world. This is meant where you bring the kingdom of God in into the workplace. The workplace is meaningless on its own. It may be a place of huge money and great intelligence and great creativity, but is spiritually immensely poor. You know, it may be a place of great incredible innovation, but great foolishness as well. Foolish things are done. Stupid things are done in the workplace. You know, the big CEO, he's got everything going for him. He sleeps with his secretary. That's foolish. He's a very intelligent man. He from Harvard Business School, but he's going to sleep with his secretary. There's great foolishness in the workplace. There's great blessings in the workplace, but also cloud of darkness in the workplace because it can be very toxic. Who's going to change the atmosphere in the workplace? You and me. Here's the point. You know, the workplace is not going to come into the church. The church must go into the workplace. New Testament tells us that. Jesus spent 92% of his ministry in the workplace. Acts of the Apostles, 97% of the miracles were in the workplace. They all went out. But as a church, today, we wait for them to come in. Now, what happens when they get converted in the workplace? How do you change the workplace? When they come to know the Lord. If it's a CEO, systems change in the workplace. If it's a bank teller, the bank teller, the language of the bank teller does change. If it's a janitor, you hear him cleaning your toilet and he's singing worship songs. It, at whatever level it is, it changes, whatever level of the authority. When Zacchaeus was converted, Jesus said these words in Luke 19 verse 10. He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you read the NIV, it just says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. 
but you go back to the original Greek. The word is there. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Why didn't he say he just saved the lost? Because Zacchaeus was saved and his family was saved. Because when Zacchaeus, what is the that? That represents the systems, the process, the atmosphere that is in the workplace. And you can bet your last penny that when Zacchaeus was saved, his marchai, his downline, they changed. He told his downline, I don't want you to, to be corrupt anymore in the way you collect taxes. His systems changed to become more transparent. Processes change. Workplace change. So the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? When sin came into the world, the workplace systems became unrighteous. It became toxic. It became dark. That's why you have toxicity in the workplace. That's why you have unrighteousness. That's why you have politicization, you know, the, you know, the office politics. You know, that's why I call office politics in the workplace. You get backstabbing, you know, rumor mongering. You have all this kind of malicious gossip. All that kind of thing happened. Sin came in. But when a CEO is changed, a bank teller is changed, or middle management is changed, the systems under this influence, the atmosphere, changes. That's how we bring the kingdom of God into the workplace. Here's the fourth thing that must change in our mindset. The church must therefore enter the workplace to change the community. This is must be. We can't just sit here. We must enter the workplace. And those of you who go, to go, out, go out to work tomorrow, you're entering the workplace. See, when you come into the workplace, because the kingdom of God is within you, somebody say amen. When the kingdom of God is within you, when you walk into your office on a Monday morning, the kingdom of God has come to the office. Before that, the kingdom of God was not there. But when you walk in, the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? The reign of Jesus. Wherever He is acknowledged and surrendered out, surrendered to, that is reign. It happens that you're the only Christian. So, the kingdom of God is within you. You walk into your office, the kingdom of God comes into your office. That's how we see the kingdom of God. And eventually, through you, many people will come to know the Lord. Systems change. The kingdom of God will come. That's God's plan A. There's no plan B. The plan A for God to touch the world for Jesus is to bring the gospel and to bring salvation and to bring the power of the kingdom of God, God's love, God's power, God's miracles, God's breakthrough into the workplace. Through the church. Not through a church that sits down just on a Sunday wait for the world to come in. But the walls are down on a Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, and into the world. That's God's plan A. You go back to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, Great Commission. You know, you, you shall be my disciples. You know, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. What is the imperative in the Great Commission? Go and make disciples. Many people say, Pastor, it's in the word Go. That's why we need to go to Tibet. We need to go to Burma. We need to go to Bhutan. You know, we need to go. That's one way of looking at it. But actually, the imperative in that commandment is make disciples. Which means, wherever you go, the imperative is, wherever you happen to be, wherever you're going, make disciples. And where do we spend one third of our lives? Workplace. The imperative command is, make disciples there. That is the Great Commission's understanding. That's God's plan A. There is no plan B. And therefore, when we go to the work, we must, as a church, we must engage the, the, the workplace. We must engage it. And then we must influence it. And then only can we transform the workplace. Okay. We must do this, this thing. Engage, influence, and transform. Here's the point. Here's the point. And this is an American study. I'm not sure about the Singapore stats, but here's the point. 87% of Christians disengage from God on a Monday morning. 87%. In other words, the moment you might have a wonderful worship service, goosebumps, Holy Spirit comes, you cry, oh God, it's so real. 87% on a Monday morning as you walk out through your front door and you slam the front door shut to go into work. 87% leave God behind. When we leave God behind, we can't engage. We're just like everybody else in a workplace. We were entered a quote-unquote rat race. We're no different. Our work is not worship. Our work is a survival place. Our work is a very secular and holy place. We're there to survive. We're not there to win. We're not there to touch. We're not there to transform. We're not there to influence. We're not there to change. So we need to engage the workplace. And what is the function of a Sunday service then? 
The function of a Sunday service is simply this. On a Sunday, you come to worship God together. Holy Spirit touches you. You get empowered. You get enthused. You get, you, you get equipped. You get inspired through the Word. And you get informed and tutored through the Word. For what? For goosebumps on a Sunday? No. So that Monday to Friday, you can actually go out and bring the kingdom of God into the workplace. Somebody say amen. That's what God wants you to do. That's why we worship on a Sunday. Otherwise, it's just a holy huddle. It's just a holy rotary club. We just get goosebumps together and enjoy. Hallelujah. Put on our halo and hallelujah. Shake hands. Very good. So I'm saying this because we need to th- turn our thinking. All over the world, God is causing His church to wake up so that we see why we, why we exist as a church. We go back to the basics and the basics are the church must break the walls down and go into the community and go in the workplace. It must do that. Let me give you some, uh, just, uh, you know, just let me give you three quick lessons from a workplace chapter in, in the Bible. Okay? There are lots of workplace examples in the Bible. If you open your eyes and look for them. Acts chapter 16 is a great chapter on workplace, on the workplace. Almost all the, the bit of Acts 16, when Paul went to Macedonia, went to Philippi. You remember? You remember when, uh, when, when a man, uh, you know, was in Paul's dream, yeah, said to Paul, come over to Macedonia and help us. That's a Macedonian call, you remember? Which was the city they went to first? Philippi. Philippi. And that's Acts 16. In Philippi, the miracles that broke place, the, if the gospel went in, where? Workplace. You read Acts 16, it's about the workplace. Okay, so let me just uh, take you to Acts chapter 16 and just tell you how it looks like when we go into the workplace. This is scriptures. Okay, three things. People say to me, Pastor, how do I start to go into the workplace? I just say, open your eyes. Tomorrow when you go into the workplace, ask God, God, open my eyes so that I don't see things that I used to see before. You know, I need to think things were like that. It must be. Be un- you can't change. Things will never be like that. So that's why, you know, I just try to survive Monday to Friday. You know, I, it's so toxic. I get, try to survive. And then get Sunday, I come back, you know, I get pumped up again. And then I go back to survive on a Monday to Friday. That's a travesty of the New Testament. You're out there to bring the kingdom of God. So when you come here to worship, you're here to be empowered, enthused, equipped, instructed, inspired, so that you can make a difference and bring the Holy Spirit at work. Three things you need to do. Firstly, open your eyes. Open your spiritual eyes and ears, and you will see this. You will see successful people in need. Many of us, we get just, wow. We see, we see successful people and think, well, they have no needs. They, you know, they drew up in a murk, and they drew up in their, their Lexus, you know what? And, and they, they come with this Hermes handbag and they wear, you know, Prada shoes. And you think, they, they have no needs. They got, they're bedecked with jewelry. They have no needs, you know. I wish I was like them. They have no needs. Don't believe it. They have needs. How do I know? I'm a doctor. I see these rich people. They have huge needs. Sometimes the marriage is falling apart. The business is under, making them stress. They, they cannot control their children. There are many things. They live in fear. They don't sleep at night. They've got issues with their mental health. They've got needs. They don't tell you, that's all. So if you don't open your eyes spiritually, you won't see the needs. You think these are millionaires. They don't have any needs. Lydia was such a person. Open your eyes and you see spiritual people we need. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city of Philippi to a riverbank. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Tyre, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. Now, if you deal in purple cloth and you're a distributor and dealer of purple cloth, you're very rich. Because to get the purple dye in those days, you actually have to get them from little crustaceans, you know, shellfish. And you, 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 you harvest this shellfish from the, from the sea and from the river, and then you press out the little purple dye in them. And you collect hundreds of thousands of the shellfish, and then you dye the cloth. And people want purple because it's royal, kind of royal color. It's a very expensive color. So if you deal in purple cloth, it's like dealing in, in, in high quality, exquisite silk. You're rich. Lydia was very rich. So she went, and as Paul was preaching, now Paul wasn't preaching in the synagogue. Lydia would never go to a synagogue. And so this is what happened. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. 
And when she and her household were baptized, she begged her saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So what was it? As she listened, something in her heart. See, sometimes you get faced by people who are rich. The Lord says, don't. You are my minister in the kingdom of God. They have needs. And I, when I open the opportunity, you stand. You are an ambassador of the King of Kings. Somebody say amen. You are a child of the King of Kings. You, are, you bring the kingdom of God there. You bring the gospel of God. You bring the good news. You bring the power of the Holy Spirit there. And they have needs. And they listen. And they come to know the Lord. And let you open. How rich was she? She was so rich so that the house was so big. She can say to Paul, Paul, Silas, Luke, you know, and Timothy and all that, come and stay in my house. Wow. She must have a big bungalow house. You know, for sure she didn't live in a, you know, a small flat, an apartment. So she was very rich. And not only that, she probably called the shots in her, because she said she and her household, she had a household. So she probably called the shots in her household. Why? You know, maybe she was married. She was married. But you know what? She doesn't need her husband's permission even, you know. Because she earns such big money. Got people like that in Singapore, no? But anyway, in Malaysia, quite, quite, they, they don't need any permission. Just come and live in my house. My husband will be okay, one. She calls her shots. She's highly successful. She's got confidence. She's got influence. But she's got needs. Needs. They won't come to church. They won't step across that wall, that, that border that they come in. Only 0.1% will do that. How are they going to hear the gospel? The church must break down these walls. And how can a church break down these walls? Monday morning, the walls get broken down. If we will engage, we will influence, and we will bring transformation. Reminds me of a story of one of my... Um, see, so in, in Skyline, we've been talking at this for the last 15 years. That's why people call us, in Malaysia, the workplace church. All our pastors are bivocational. Oh, they're all bivocational. BVPs, Okay. And uh, so they're out in the workplace all the time. You know, they, uh, so they're out in the workplace all the time, nine to five window. So we teach them how to bring the kingdom of God into the workplace. In Malaysia, it's an extra challenge because there's corruption in the workplace. Singapore, not a major problem. Okay, but in Malaysia, major challenge. How, can you make business? Can you survive in the workplace? But if you're bringing the kingdom of God, you, you have to encounter this and you have to make your stand. They thrive. They do well. God is with them. And they break through. So I have a bank manager. One of my elders is a, is a regional bank manager. Outstanding, top, top grade in the nation, regional bank manager. He comes across another regional bank manager who is a pre-believer. And this regional bank manager, he will never step into church in a million years. He hates Christians. He thinks all Christians are hypocrites. You know, that's what he says. Sometimes people tell me, you know, I don't go to church because the Christian church is full of hypocrites. I always say, there's always room for one more, you know what I mean? I mean anyway, so um, she says, I, I, he'd never go. And then this elder, who is our, our, our regional bank manager, saw him in a mall. And he said, what are you doing here? Oh, he says, I went to the physiotherapist here. I've got this bad neck ache for the last two months. It wouldn't get better. We already taught our guys, you can pray in the workplace. So immediately, our regional bank manager, who is uh, my, one of my elders, says, uh, <clears throat> you don't mind, he's actually quite nervous, but I said, you know, can I pray for you? Uh? Pray for Jesus to heal you. And this other regional bank manager, who's a pre-believer, thought, this guy is freaky. Do you know what? You know, but he's my friend. And we are both successful regional bank managers, so I also respect him. Yeah, if you want to pray, pray. Do you know what? He would never, this guy would never come to church. So they prayed for him in a mall. He prayed for them in a mall. And after that, he says, oh, praise God. You know, he didn't ask, how's your neck? Because he had not much faith. So he just said, okay, God bless, bye-bye, you know, and uh, went. And then he thought, as he walked away, he thought to myself, oh, I've really blown it. I made a fool of myself. That's how we all start in the workplace. We think we'll make a fool of ourselves. But you carry the kingdom of God. Believe it. You may make a fool of yourself once or twice. But if you don't step out, you will never know. But if you step out, things can really change. So this is what, can somebody say amen? And so, so, so he, he walked away. He was quite nervous. And he said, I tried to avoid, I didn't even ring this guy for a whole week. You know? And then I was walking along one day in the streets and I heard a voice, hey, calling my name. He said, and I turned out of the corner of my eye. I saw it was this guy. I walked faster. And he, this guy caught up with me, was breathless. Hey, he said, you remember you prayed for me? Here he comes, he said. He's going to mock me. 
He said, that day after that, uh, my pain went, you know. Two months it wasn't, but it, it went. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And now, you have engaged, you see. You now have influence. And so this regional bank manager says, yeah, praise God. Why didn't you come and join us on the lunchtime? We have, you know, do Alpha on the lunchtime. What's Alpha? You know, we just help to discover together, watch a video and see, you know, if there's more, if there's more to life than just work. Uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, because what you do, somebody healed your neck, so you better go. Before that, pain in the neck. Now, okay. You know, might as well go. So he went, the Alpha. He says, I didn't want to go. I was reluctant. But he went eventually. And after he dragged his wife there, and sometimes he didn't want to go, he put the wife there and he went somewhere else. <laughs> but eventually God touched his heart and he became open. And eventually he came to the church. He would never walk across. And he told his sister, I'm going to church to satisfy this friend one time only. That's it. I will never become a Christian. That day, Holy Spirit worked. He came and cried and gave his heart to the Lord. Today, he's one of my leaders in the church. And then he went and told other bank managers about what's happened. And then suddenly, over a few months, I had a whole row of bank managers saved. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing, right? Whole row, bank managers there. None of them will ever walk into church on their own. They will never get saved in the church. They have now come for an evangelistic meeting. But they're all from backgrounds unchurched. They came to be saved. Successful people have needs. You need to open your eyes. Secondly, when you open your eyes, oppress people. Oppress. There are many people whom you see, your colleagues at work, they look very well formed and, you know, very well together, but they're not sleeping at night. They've got mental health issues. They've got fear. They've got challenges in their lives. They've got family challenges. They've got, they're oppressed. And sometimes the enemy oppresses them so badly. And this is what happened to the Apostle Paul when he was in Philippi. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 21. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. This demon slave girl followed them as they went to preach the gospel. Every time they preached that Jesus is Lord, and say, oh guys, I want, you know, I want to share the gospel with you, Paul would say, and then this girl would be at the back. She was a fortune-telling girl, demon-possessed. She would say, these men are servants of the Most High God. These men are servants of the Most High God. These men are servants of the Most High God. You think that, that's a compliment, right? But it's just interfering with the gospel preaching, and Paul realized it's demonic. Turn and said to her, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get out of her and cast the demon out of her. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Are there demon possessed people, demonized people in your workplace? You bet. Yeah. Okay, so they don't, they're not crazy, that's all. But they have a lot of oppression in their life. Uncontrollable anger. You know, insane, you know, bitterness and insane vindictiveness. Deeply oppressed and that they're deeply in demonic practices in their life privately. Who's going to set them free? You are, because that's the kingdom of God coming. And that's what Jesus preached when he first came on planet Earth. He didn't talk about going to the cross first and he must die for the salvation of the world. First half of his public ministry, the first one and a half years, this is what he said. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is here. And immediately the demons challenged him. So when you come into the workplace, you bring the kingdom of God there and you meet oppressed people. Let me give you an example of what happened. In my clinic one day, somebody who came to my clinic was, was, uh, was struck mute. He, he, was, he was a carpenter working in... Um, not a carpenter. He was a, a builder contractor working in a, a, a student's hostel. Uh, and this student's hostel had a lot of people from the kampongs and others, and there was mass hysteria broke out in the student's hostel. And obviously, a, a demonic activity was going out there, and girls were screaming, you know, because it was a girl's hostel, and falling, you know, falling and rolling on the floor and crying, and, and they were oppressed. And he was in that vicinity, and he got struck dumb. After that, he couldn't talk. For a whole week, he couldn't talk. He was just walking around with his, you know, his family didn't know what to do. Just took him to various doctors. So eventually he came to, came to my clinic, and he with his family, and, and they said, you know, he's, he's dumb, he's not spoken a word for a whole week. Can you treat him? I said, there's no medicine to treat, you know, mute, just mutism and just dumbness. I, I, you know, I just, there's no medicine. And they said, but I just sense that this is a demonic oppression. So I said, 
I sense this is, the, you don't mind, I, I sense there's a spirit upon him that's making him dumb. And at this point in time, the family, they were they're in for anything because they're so desperate. So I said, can, can I pray for him? And they said, yes. Then just as I was about to pray for him, I'm just like, I want to take a deep breath. And I heard, I had the kind of oppression, I felt the oppression. And almost like a voice saying to me, if you pray, I will scream. I will scream. And I knew there are a lot of patients waiting outside in my clinic. And if there's somebody here who will scream, ah, all my patients would run. So shall I or shall I not pray? There's oppression on him. So I said, I, I spoke to the demonic spirit, and the family thought I was crazy. I said, in Jesus' name, demonic spirit, you shall not scream, you shall not shout, you shall not scream. I'll take authority first. And then I laid hands on him, and I prayed. And I command the spirit to get out in Jesus' name. And the family stood around him. And you know, when, after I prayed that, I said to him, can you speak now? Can you talk? You just look at me. I said, can you talk? Just say something. I said, can you say Jesus? I said, Jesus. Didn't you? Jesus, say Jesus. I said, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Can you say Jesus? Jesus, 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 Jesus. And she was crying as he said that. And he started talking nonstop. And God released him. The family were crying. Family were crying. And at that point in time, very easy to bring the whole family to the Lord. Very easy. And this man came to the Lord. He became a very, very faithful servant in the church, in the Chinese church, you know, for many, many years. Oppressed people. Who are the people who are going to touch the people who got mental health problems, who are suicidal, who are depressed? Okay, they've seen doctors. Nothing wrong with that. But you can touch them. You can touch them. And they are your colleagues. They're your people that you know in the workplace. And you carry the kingdom of God in your workplace. Somebody say, Amen. Thirdly, open your eyes and you will see hardened people in need. Who was the hardened people in the story? The Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas were severely beaten and they were thrown into prison. The jailer then put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas, and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. I will tell you about jailers, and these are the people you also meet at work. They are tough nuts. They're hardened people. They swear. They're crude language. You know, they make all kinds of crude language. They're quite toxic to sometimes to work around. The Philippian jailer was like that. Jailers in the first century AD were people who had used, finished their useful, active military service life. They're probably in their 40s. They'd killed lots of people already, gone to many battles already. So they're battle hardened. They're used to obscenities and curses and swearing. That's their life. And so to reward them, you give them a, 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 a jailer, a uh, post. And so these guys are hard. They're hard nuts. Just like you face in the workplace, hard nuts. There are lots of guys who are like that. Who curse and swear and totally toxic, you know. And this guy was really toxic. He, you know, he put them, he put Paul and Silas into the low inner dungeons, probably beat them up, you know, and, and you know, swear at them, spat at them, everything else. And then, you know, the earthquake happened. They were praying and they were singing hymns to God and the jailer was probably listening as well, you know, and others were listening. And then the earthquake happened. The, the doors of the prison flew open and, and the Philippian jailer thinking that this is it because in, in, in ancient Roman, uh, you know, uh, the Roman Empire government, if, you, if a one prison escaped, you pay for it with your life. So he thought all the prisoners escaped, so he's about to kill himself. And Paul said, no, the doors are open, but the prisoners are all here. Now, I can't imagine how the prisoners are all there except for the fact that somehow God sort of paralyzed all the rest of them. You know, they, they, can't, they, they were so, so much in fear that they did not move or whatever. And then when he saw that there was a miracle, his life was saved. Prisoners didn't escape. And there was an earthquake. He fell before Paul and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I've seen hardened people come to know the Lord like this. Very hard people. You know, I tell often the story of a friend of mine, a, a person of mine who was very hard. In, 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 in my town. You know, he was in the, the building, contracting, designing, uh, building, contracting, designing industry. And he is such a good designer because, because 
He is totally meticulous. He's a perfectionist. If you go to his house, everything is in order. You pick up a crystal vase to look at it, make sure it goes back exactly the same spot. Because otherwise, you've got problems. That's why he couldn't keep his girlfriends. All his girlfriends, they argued with him because they were not perfect enough for him. But he was an excellent designer because he's perfection. But because of this, this perfectionist tendency, he had a terrible temper. You know, and all the builders and all the contractors were terrified of him. I don't know about contractors in Singapore, but in KK, contractors, huh? wow, they're not afraid of anybody. One. They're very rough. And their skulls are so thick that if you smash a nail, it, try to hammer a nail into the skull, the nail will bend in KK. Yeah? But the contractors were afraid of him because he, was, he, you know, he had language and he had physical threats. Hard nut in town. But because of his stress that he put upon himself, he had bad gastric pains all the time. I threw everything I had at him. Didn't work. I brought him to full gospel businessmen's meeting. He just like dismissed. He came with me, but he walked out. He told some of his friends, huh, this is Dr. Philip. He thinks so easy. Convert me. Huh, I know what he's trying to do. But I just show him face. That's why I came. That's what he said to all his friends. And one day he was in KL. He was under high, such high stress. He bled from his, his stomach. He took a first plane, flew back to KK to see me. And I said, you know what? I've done everything for you. There's nothing else I can do. You know, I, you know, I, I can treat you better. And then he was said like, but it's lunchtime. He says, I said, can you eat? He says, yes. Okay, let's go and eat porridge. So I ate, sat down. And I said, you know what? There's only one thing. I've said this to you. I've said this one. Only God can heal you. He says, how can God heal me? I said, Let me, can I pray for you? Oh, he says, not in this place. People know me. People know me in this place. <laughs> Don't pray for me. Okay. I said, well, where can I pray for you? He said, well, you want? You can come to my house. So, so I went to his house after work. And that was his studio. His studio, his side studio attached to the house. And you must understand. So I, I went into the studio. He was there behind the table waiting for me. He said, oh, thank you for coming. Pray for me now. Everything was in the perfect place. So, you know, I laid hands on him. You know, he's totally cynical. I laid hands on him. And suddenly, something happened. He started crying for no rhyme or reason. He was totally in confidence and con control. He started crying, weeping, wailing, you know. He said, I don't know why I'm crying. No, I never cried before. And it's true. I've been to his parents' funeral. I've never seen him cry. Oh, I don't know why I'm crying. Then I said, now suddenly the Holy Spirit gave me a word to say. I said, you know why you're crying? I don't know. He said, uh, he said you're crying because you have come home. Oh, he cried some more, you know. And then now, it's all the snot was coming out. All the chendol anointing was also coming out. And then he started, started looking for his tissue. No, he's a perfectionist. The box of tissues is always in the bottom right-hand corner of the table. Always. Hey, look for the tissue. It's not there. The box was not there. Holy Spirit smuggled a tissue box somewhere else already. <laughs> hey, he cried. Oh, the snot was coming down. He eventually took up his sleeve and went... <laughs> He came to know the Lord. He was one of the hard nuts. And when the town knew that this guy has come to know the Lord, they said, I won't last. But I, I mentored him and discipled him for many years after that. And this is what he did. He could reach people I could not reach. He used to go to the building site. And he said, do you believe in Jesus? They said, no. Come with me to church on Sunday. Okay? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll come. <laughs> I, I can't do that. That's how you reach the world. And many of these builders, some of these builders who are doing contract for us in our new building, they came to know Lord through him. So when this happens, Ed Silvosu reminds us of this. It says, the church needs to cease being a spectator. It must play as if it is convinced it can and will win. Somebody say amen. And the first step is to realize that we are called and empowered to disciple the nations and the workplace and the poor in the community. And everyone else that's outside the walls of the church that God points our hearts to. And that if we do this, we can succeed if we try. What's the impact? As I close, can I have the musicians out now? What's the impact as I, as I close? You listen to this and you read the, the scriptures. Okay? Firstly, whole families are saved. The Philippian jailer, he and his family were baptized. He rejoiced and believed with, in God with all his household. Here's the thing about workplace salvations, you know. I see it again and again in, in ministry, in, in, in the church. People get saved in a household. Huh? Families get saved very easily. I don't know about you, but 
when somebody gets saved in a church or a youth meeting or whatever, and then, then go back and try to tell the family that, you know, that we got saved. <laughs> they say, you've been, you've, been, you've been brainwashed. You're following a cult. You're holding a white man's religion. You know, it's, it's all these people who are brainwashing. They want your money. They will say these kind of things. Right? And you take years to touch a family. But I find this. When people get saved in the workplace, often whole families get saved. You go to scriptures. When the Philippine jailer was saved in the workplace, whole family. When Lydia got saved in the workplace, whole family. When Cornelius got saved in the workplace, whole family. When Zacchaeus got saved in the workplace, whole family. When Publius of Malta got saved in the workplace because his father was healed of dysentery, family. Workplace. There's something incredible about workplace salvations. That's why we must think workplace and the community outside. And when they get saved, systems get changed, as I told you. You know, for Zacchaeus, the tax collecting system for sure will be changed. When they get saved, atmosphere change. If, for example, the CEO of a company change, uh, is, is saved, CEO atmosphere in a company will change. Processes, systems will change. You know, what's the atmosphere, the core values of a company? Change. It will change. And the kingdom of God has come. That's why Billy Graham said these words. He said, I believe, I believe that one of the greatest moves of God is going to be through believers in the workplace. Somebody say amen. The next revival has to include the workplace. It has to. Because the next revival has to touch the largest mission field in the world. It has to include the workplace. It cannot take place in the confines of just a church building. It has to reach the workplace. Do you have a vision for that? And that's why during the pandemic, I wrote a book of, that I've been wanting to write for the last, you know, so many years. So many years I've been wanting to write uh, this book called The Invasive Kingdom. And uh, eventually during the pandemic, I had two full years, I, I, you know, in that time I, I wrote. That in the, it's about the convictions about the workplace. The Invasive Kingdom is very simply this. The kingdom of God lives in you. When you walk into work on a Monday morning, the kingdom of God has invaded the workplace. That's why it's the invasive kingdom. And so it's for every one of us to begin to change our thinking. This book will tell you how to equip yourself and to have a vision for the workplace. Whether you're retired, whether you're a student, whether you're a homemaker, whether you're in a nine-to-five window, you need to know that God wants to use you in the workplace, in your, in your HDB area, in your Kopitiam, amongst your friends, amongst the strangers whom you meet, other parents you meet in the PTAs or whatever. You need to understand that. God has given you a purpose for life beyond the walls of a church. It's called the invasive kingdom. And this will equip you. It will bring conviction to your life. And it will make you contagious about the workplace. And the other books that I have written uh, in the past, Slingshots, Slingshots is about a book, you know, about various nuggets, you know, insights. I used to write a bulletin for the church every Sunday about insights into what is happening in the world, what is God saying to the world today, what are some of the insights from my devotion, how we can be equipped, you know, to be inspired, to live up for God. It's called Slingshots. Why do I call it Slingshots? It's very simple. All these nuggets are in just one page of 300 words. That's it. You just read one page, you can read another page, there's another slingshot, another slingshot. And I believe these slingshots will help bring down the giants in your life. It will inspire you to bring down the giants. So that's why I call them slingshots and you might enjoy them reading. And if you're one of those who like to read in the toilet, slingshots is perfect for you because you read just one page and two pages and you come back again another day and you can go through it in a year. And the final book is uh, The Call of Issachar. I can't move it on. Yeah, Call of Issachar and it's about prayer. It's about us knowing the signs of the times and how we need to pray for our nation and pray for the church. Praise God. All his bowed, all eyes closed as I, as I finish right now. Wherever you are, God is speaking to us. Speaking to us. You are a light. Jesus says, you're a light. Some of us are just lamp lights. Others are lampstand lights. Others are, you know, a lights where it shines so that people may see our good works. We are like floodlights. But here's the point. Every one of us, together, all of us, in this church, we need to be like lights on a city, on a hill. How do people know in this nation and in this city that Jesus is alive? When the churches all light up. Right? All the churches in Singapore light up. How, where are they going to light up? You think on a Sunday, nobody sees because it's all in the walls. Nobody sees these lights. 
when all of Singapore, all the churches light up and we're in the workplace, Monday to Friday, we're like a city on a hill. The whole of Singapore knows. It's blessed. The gospel goes out. And that's what God has called us to do right now. And the, the reason why He's called you is because He loves you. He truly loves you and He wants to give you a new purpose, a new vision, and a new love and enrichment for your life to fill you with purpose right now. In a short while, I'm going to pray for those of you who want to receive Jesus into your heart. You may have never received Jesus into your heart before. You have never. You've never committed your life to Jesus. But today, you say, Pastor, I, I, I want to receive. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to invite Jesus into my heart. I want His life. I want His love. I want His purpose and mission. I want His power in my life so that I'll be equipped to live out my purpose for Him. And you've never asked Jesus to come into your life before. Okay? You've never asked Jesus. But today, God has brought you into this church not by you know, coincidence or accident, but by divine appointment. He wants you to know Him. If you say, Pastor Philip, you know, I, in a short while, I'm going to pray for everyone who wants to receive Jesus, who've never received Jesus before. At the count of three, if you want to receive Jesus in your life, just lift up your hand. I will acknowledge that hand. Okay? Are you ready now? If you want me to pray so that you receive Jesus in your life and you say, Pastor, I want to receive. At the count of three, lift up your hand. Are you ready now? One, two, three. Just lift it up. If there's any one of you here, if you've never received Jesus before, lift up your hand. Be happy to acknowledge that hand. So I see in this, in this church building, every one of us knows Jesus. Praise God. I hope so. And I thank God for that. Amen. But here's one final thing I want to pray before, we, before I dismiss. You know, I, I finish what I want to say today. I just sense the Spirit of God wants to anoint us, every one of us, for the workplace. Every one of us, God wants to anoint us for the workplace. Whether you're retired, whether you're a student, whether you're the homemaker, whether you're working in a 9 to 5 window. If your desire is to recovenant with the Lord and commit yourself to the Lord, so your prayer is, God, use me in my place of work. Use me in my retirement. Use me in my institution or my, my, my school or my university. Use me. You know, wherever I am, just use me outside the walls of a church. I want to be anointed by you to use so that I bring the kingdom of God into the workplace. You want God to use you. You want to commit yourself and covenant with the Lord so that today, you no longer see yourself as just a believer in the workplace but you become a workplace minister. You're going to minister the kingdom of God in the workplace. That's your desire. I want you to stand up on your feet right now because I want to pray for each one of you who make that commitment to the Lord. Okay? God is calling everyone to do that, but I don't want to assume that you know you are ready for that. But if you say, I want, I want to have a purpose, I want to have a, a vision, I want to have a mission beyond just my place of retirement, just my, the, the church, the four walls of the church. I want to do that. I want to pray for each one of you right now. Anyone more? Just, just stand up on your feet right now if that's you right now. I'm just waiting for everyone who wants to stand up to stand up. Okay, I'm not forcing anyone to stand up, but even you at home, you're watching this, stand up on your feet right now because I want to pray for you. And when you do so, whether you're a retiree, whether you're a student, a homemaker, or whether you're in a nine-to-five, you are God's workplace minister. Right now, just lift up your hands right now. Every one of us, open our hands, lift it up right now. Open your hearts right now. Father, I just pray and thank you for each and every one whose hearts are open to you, whose hands are lifted up, Lord. You touch our spirits, not just with your word, oh God, but with your voice today. And I pray for a fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit into every life today. I pray for Jesus to be so real to you, not just on a Sunday, but on a Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday. So wherever you go, we pray, I pray right now, I pray for a fresh anointing to fall on you, that you will bring the kingdom of God to your place of work, and that your hands will touch lives that are changed. Your eyes will see transformation and your heart will rejoice in the fruit that God will bring to your place of work and outside the walls of this church. In the name of Jesus, I pray wherever you go, you will be a carrier of the kingdom of God. You will be part and parcel of all that God is doing here in the nation of Singapore through the invasive kingdom. His kingdom coming to pass and to coming in manifestation through you. Lord, anoint your people, anoint this, your sons and daughters, fill them right now with your Holy Spirit that they may see your glory and they may see revival in their place of work and in wherever you send them in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name and all God's wonderful people said, Amen and Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand. God bless you all.